So uh, without further ado, I will hand it over to Gail, our presentation chair, and she'll introduce tonight's presentation. Thanks, Gail. Hi. Um, well, I want to welcome um, Dr. Fred Swanson. He's a retired um, research geologist, and he was with the Pacific Northwest Research Station uh, of the U.S. Forest Service. And um, I was um, very pleased to get him. He, he very graciously volunteered at the very last minute because our uh, our scheduled speaker has an illness in his family and uh, I just felt it would be good that he have time to be with his family. So I really thank you, Fred, for um, volunteering. And I had heard his talk just uh, maybe a week before and it was so good that I just thought I'd reach out and see if I could get him to help us uh, with this. And so I think you're really gonna enjoy this talk. So welcome, Fred. Uh, good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you for giving me a seat at your dinner table. Uh, I'll try to get the screen share going here. Oops, that's a little further into the presentation. Okay. And um, <clears throat> I'm happy to help out. Um, especially help Eric. I hope he'll be with you soon, Eric Wagner. Um, I've interacted with him for about seven years now as he prepared and completed and then toured his uh, book on the um, story of ecological research uh, at Mount St. Helens. And he does a terrific job he has a PhD in ecology from UW, and he's an excellent and entertaining writer. Uh, he actually joined with uh, Charlie Crisofoli, the Forest Service ecologist, the principal ecologist of Mount St. Helens, myself and some others of us, um, down at Calbuco Volcano in Chile, which erupted in 2015. And Eric wanted a sense of how excited ecologists get when they encounter a freshly volcanically disturbed landscape. And he couldn't do that at Mount St. Helens because he was two years old at the time, but um, he joined us and it was uh, fun and fruitful. So <clears throat> uh, I've prepared this talk um, for circumstances that were more Western Oregon than Western Washington. So. I hope you'll excuse uh, some of that uh, aspect to what I talk about. And this uh, lead off image is from um, the um, Holiday Farm Fire, one of several multi 100,000 acre fires in Western Oregon um, in last, last September and, and they lingered. And I call this um, ecosystem disturbances some uncommon views because I've worked in this field of sort of disturbance ecology as a physical process person for a long time. And so I'm, I address the physical processes themselves for the most part. And I'm going to talk about them um, with respect and not terror. And although I am fully aware of the uh, profound uh, negative impacts they have on people. So this is an image looking up the Mackenzie River towards the three sisters, snow peaks in the distance, Mackenzie on the right. And you see some of the diversity of uh, burn severities from last September's fire across the forest landscape, but also you see the decimated town of Blue River at the bottom of the image. So there were tremendous impacts on humans. And in this one fire of 173,000 acres, about 450 homes were completely leveled. There was no fighting of structure fires because 
the fire was burning uh, to the west, to the Willamette Valley, where structure firefighters might have come from, but they weren't going to go into that incredibly hazardous zone. So the houses, the homes, for the most part, burned to the ground. But I won't address that human dimension, uh, although I know it's really important. Uh, let's see. So the general outline of the talk is to address these as big change events. Uh, disturbance um, is a term with uh, negative connotations and commonly used in the ecological language, but I'm using big change events for reasons I'll explain a little bit later in the talk. And because they are profound changes, they can provoke profound changes in science and for humans. And I'm going to run through four examples, ones that I've lived through. Mount St. Helens eruption of 1980, the forest wars of the late 80s and early 90s, actually more protracted, but that was sort of the, the peak period. Uh, the 1996 flood that we experienced in this region, and then the 2020 wildfires of Western Oregon. And I think of these in terms of these, each of these, in terms of these five properties. The first three have a bunch of science uh, involved in them. And the second, uh, the, the last two are more in the human dimension. So <clears throat> feeling across time for the first three, um, scientists do a lot of work on the history of events of these types uh, to provide clues to future occurrences and consequences. And then the second point concerns right during the event itself and shortly thereafter, when it is possible for scientists to have aha moments um, that can lead to uh, changes in the course of science uh, done on these topics and these phenomena. And then third, following this course of time, um, scientists are really keen on looking at ecosystem responses as they unfold over time, over months, years, and longer. And then <clears throat> in the dominantly human realm, these events prompt important changes in our thinking, and change is tough for humans in many cases. And finally, uh, conflicting values, conflicting impressions and uh, opinions about what the natural world is there for, uh, confront us and come front and center in these con contexts. So the first case is Mount St. Helens. This is an image of Mount St. Helens before she erupted in 1980. And there was quite a good deal of work on the history, the eruptive history of Mount St. Helens and a bunch of other Cascade volcanoes um, before 1980. And two uh, US Geological Survey volcanologists, uh, tephra chronologists especially, they studied the volcanic ejecta um, to interpret their eruptive history. So in the lower right here is an outcrop on the east side of Mount St. Helens. There's a person there on the left side of that photo insert. Um, and we see layers upon layers of tephra. And uh, you know, Rocky Crandall and Don Molyneux had been studying Mount St. Helens for quite a few years leading up to 1978 when they published papers in a USGS bulletin and <clears throat> also in science um, assessing uh, potential hazards from future eruptions based on the history that they had interpreted from the previous 10,000 years plus of uh, volcanic um, ejecta. 
And in that um, USGS bulletin, they said, the volcano's behavior pattern suggests that the current quiet interval, which at that point was about 120 years long, will not last as long as a thousand years. Instead, an eruption is more likely to occur within the next century, and perhaps even before the end of this century. And they went on to say, if the next eruptive period is like the last, which continued from 1831 to 56, intermittent activity of various scales and various kinds can be expected over a period of several decades. Well, damn, they nailed it. Uh, before the eruption, a view to the north from the summit in the upper right looks down across Spirit Lake, which is formed as a consequence of a fan of debris in the lower left of that upper right image that blocked the flow of water from the drainages in the mid part of that image down to the left to the west down the North Fork of the Tootle. So we're looking across Spirit Lake, the Mount Margaret High Country with a spattering of snow and then Rainier in the distance. And then kaboom, the eruption on the left, May 18th, 832 on a Sunday morning. And that produced, that modified that landscape to the image on the lower right. This is a helicopter view because the summit, about a cubic mile mountaintop, had busted loose and flowed out into Spirit Lake, chunks of it surfing up the left arm, the west arm of Spirit Lake there. And most, and some of it surfing over, you know, riding over Johnson's Ridge, a thousand foot high ridge um, immediately uh, north of the crater. And most of it uh, rumbled as a debris avalanche about 12 miles down the North Tootle River over the span of about 10 minutes as revealed in the seismic records. And as a part of this blast and the unroofing of the magma chamber, which had grown and been intruded into the north flank of the volcano over the course of a couple months, a great volcanic blast, a steam driven blast was released to the north covering about 125 square miles, removing forests close to the vent, toppling forests beyond that, and then as the blast lost vigor, as it spread out and dropped its big rocks and the big chunks of forest that it had entrained close to the vent, then it lost the oomph to topple the forest and simply singed it around the margins. And so there was a whole a, a mix, a potpourri of uh, processes involved here. I had the strange and for me good fortune to get to go in there on day 10 to the ridge where aha is noted. A couple places in this talk, there'll be an aha. And it was day 10 and I was with uh, three other geologists. We got a, some helicopter drops here and there and we we're trying to figure out whether the blast or the landslide got to different locations first. And I dug a shallow pit, maybe eight or nine inches deep in the new blast deposits, a fragmented uh, fine gravel, granular, pebbly sized rock um, on Johnson's Ridge, uh, just a little east of the Johnson's Ridge Observatory. And within a few minutes, the gentle breeze was leaving little particles, maybe an eighth of an inch, um, in diameter dangling from the walls of the pit from spider web like filaments. And I learned later, I realized that these were burn site fungi, fungi, um, the, the mycelia of burn site fungi that were, had in only 10 days ramified through these new deposits. Apparently, this, they had been triggered and by the heat of the blast. So I had, I had three things that, that I learned from that. 
one, the biology responded immediately. And two, there were winners and losers. So all the big dug fur, all the elk died within the blast zone. But the more cryptic organisms, many of them could survive and, 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 and burst forth. And third, this was a case where these uh, fungi had um, adapted to being heated and um, sending their mycelia out through recently heated landscapes, uh, shallow soil in, in heated landscapes. But they'd adapted to forest fires, not to volcanic blasts, which are so infrequent that they aren't really an evolutionary force. And <clears throat> so that led to the idea that when we think about different kinds of disturbance agents in ecosystems, whether they're volcanic of one type or another, or non-volcanic, such as forest fire and wind throw and things of this nature, we have to be thinking about the actual disturbance mechanisms, which are what the organisms experience. They don't know whether they were hit by a volcanic blast, a forest fire, a, a mud flow, or you know these different types. So that was uh, an interesting uh, aspect of our science learning. And so, as I mentioned, uh, Mount St. Helens eruption was an incredible learning environment for ecologists and disturbance ecologists in particular. However, the, the whole field of disturbance ecology hadn't gained, did not gain much definition until the mid eighties. And this was an event that occurred in 1980. And so um, we were out there feeling our way in a landscape <clears throat> that was in so many respects so unfamiliar. So the eruption involved <clears throat> the sweeter processes on the left here. There was the giant landslide that took the mountaintop and spread it out over about 50 square kilometers, shown on the image in the upper left, leaving a hummocky landscape. And um, a, a monstrous mud flow or lahar was produced as water was sort of squoze out of the lower part of that uh, giant landslide. And, and this mud flow flowed down the North Toodle and led to uh, closure of the I-5 I bridge and the railroad there, entered the Cowlitz and then the Columbia and so forth. And so then here in the uh, right center of the suite of images, is, it, is the uh, mud flow on the Muddy River on the east side of St. Helens. So there's a big helicopter there on the right side and there are a couple of people standing there with their um, Nomex suits in the middle of the image. And so there you see the high mud flow line and the old growth trees along the Muddy River, a massive mud flow. Mud flows were triggered in different ways around the, um, down most drainages surrounding the mountain. The blast created that toppled forest zone over a vast area and then there's the upper right is the scorched zone. Um, on the afternoon of May 18th and subsequent eruptions, pyroclastic flows with big pumice blocks at 700 degrees centigrade flowed out onto the pumice plain in the lower right image is an example of that. And then um, wind blew the blast deposit and then the ash that was being, the tephra that was being emitted, emitted from the volcano um, on May 18th and in subsequent days after that and subsequent eruptions. And it, it blanketed the forest and ultimately it was blown around the globe. And then these physical processes interacted with these types of ecosystems listed on the right pre-existing forest, meadows, non-forest, lakes and streams. And then 
some entirely new systems were created. Now, my own work in the early days had to do with looking at the erosion of the new deposits, mainly in the blast zone, and how that proceeded over time and how it interacted with, with vegetation was coming back in on the site. So here's an area about five miles east of the volcano uh, within the blast zone. Um, and this is a chrono sequence of images. Uh, the circle there, you may see it best in the upper right, the 1981, January 81 image <clears throat> is the helicopter. So you can get a sense of the scale. It's a pretty big area. This, this area had been clear cut. It was uh, before the eruption. You can see stumps and you can see spindly little stems of um, small trees, which had been planted on the site um, in the plantation and um, and were toppled or tilted. And so uh, summer of 80, and then in the upper right, uh, January of 81, there'd been some fall rains, they'd cut gullies. Uh, the gully cutting for the most part went through the new deposits There were only half a meter, foot and a half thick. And then the gully cutting stalled out for several reasons, including encountering the old forest floor that had uh, uh, there had high infiltration capacity, so the water could quickly go down into the soil rather than flow over the surface or down the gully floor. And also uh, there was a lot of woody material there, both from uh, the forest condition and then uh, logging slash. And then by year four, uh, plants were starting to come up preferentially from the gully floor as well. Wow, that was a bit of an aha. Uh -huh. uh, you think of erosion as a bad thing, but the new deposits had very low nutrient uh, content. And, and the gully cutting um, had exposed the old forest soil and buried you know, seed banks and, and root stocks could, that could then emerge from the, from the gully floors. And then by year 14, after the eruption, uh, we started to have um, more widespread um, forest development. So you see some willows in there, but, but a bunch of dug firs also that were seeding in naturally. This area was not planted. Uh, this, all this work led to uh, a great advance in, in the emergence really of volcano ecology. And Charlie Crisofoli, who is a forest service ecologist based at Mount St. Helens who retired last Friday. Um, he and I, he brings the ecology perspective. I bring the geology perspective and a bunch of colleagues, uh, mainly experienced uh, with other volcanoes. Um, have taken a look at the broad picture and tried to rally the community um, at a global scale. So, uh, here's a map of volcanoes shown in triangles uh, and about 400 have erupted for uh, about 400 of the about 1500 in the USGS Smithsonian catalog of volcanoes. About 400 of those 1500 have experienced an eruption since 1883 when Krakatoa popped off. And so we sort of count that as the beginning of the, the era of volcano ecology. But only about 10% of those 400 known eruptions have had published um, ecological studies, studies of, of the consequence, the, the ecological responses to the eruption. And here you can see that the volcanoes are pretty well distributed you know, around spreading centers and subduction zones and in different biomes. And so uh, we have a sort of a global story there that we've summarized in a couple of publications. Um, here's another way of looking at this uh, volcano ecology story post or Krakatoa plus. Um, so here's a timeline. Krakatoa, 1883. And then we're sort of accumulating here over the timeline, um, little volcano 
um, icons of four eruptions. And um, you can see this, uh, there may be a slight increase in towards more recent times. Uh, these are the ones that have had ecological research at them. And um, it's interesting to note that three stand out as rather intensively studied. One is Krakatoa and there were many, so then the vertical ticks, uh, a, a red vertical tick is a publication date of an animal study and a green vertical tick is a plant, a published plant study. So three volcanoes have gotten a lot of study. Krakatoa, and it took a while for that to get going out into the 1920s and into the, through the 30s. And then a big spate of activity uh, in the latter 1980s and in, into the 2000s. A cert sea, which erupted from beneath the sea in the Vestman Islands, southwest of Iceland, has had a very consistent history of study. And the Icelandic government um, controls access to the area and has annual visits um, documenting uh, how things are changing. And then Mount St. Helens. And because it has such diversity, a very interesting and dramatic phenomena. And it is so accessible and it is in a country loaded with ecologists who love to study this stuff and disturbance ecology was really picking up in the eighties. And so it accounts for a large fraction of the total publication record. So a few key lessons from volcano ecology. One is you go out into the landscape and it's all gray. And you think, wow, this place was sterilized. And yet it was abundant live and dead biological legacies uh, in, in most cases. And they can, they're legacies from the pre-eruption ecosystem and they can strongly influence what happens with how the, the response of the post-eruption ecosystem. The timing and chance um, are incredibly important. The time of day uh, were semi-fossorial organisms in their hidey holes were they out in the open. Um, the time of the week, you know, this was a Sunday and people were, were clamoring to get in there to their cabins in the Spirit Lake area. And, and um, the, the loggers and tree planters and so forth um, on private state and federal lands were not out on, on the landscape on a Sunday morning for the most part. And so the stage of succession, all these uh, phenomena operating on different time scales all came into play. Uh, the season of the year, it was early, it was a spring condition. So there were still patches of snow that could function as refuges. There were still ice on some of the Alpine lakes. So anyway, there were many dimensions of timing and chance. And um, also there was uh, the primary disturbances were so profound that they kicked into gear a whole bunch of secondary disturbances. There were geophysical disturbances. There were biotic disturbances. They're responding to interesting and unusual uh, plant communities, for example. So uh, there are many elements of um, volcano ecology. So the Mount St. Helens case, here's sort of a summary, and I'll go through a uh, figure like this for each of the four cases. You know, the eruption history led to quite uh, a tight prediction from a geologist perspective, which is the one I bring. Close in observations, you know, there were winners and losers. There was an immediate response of life. The biological legacies were manifest in the first summer. And there's, there's this important, from a scientist perspective, you know, distinguishing the mechanisms from the types of disturbance agents that were involved. And the responses, uh, the, the science community, as Eric uh, 
Wagner will tell you when he gets a chance to speak with you, you know, is studying so many facets. And now we're, we're approaching the, um, you know, 41st anniversary. And uh, the responses have been highly varied in pace and type across the disturbance zones and the disturbance intensities of those zones involved. But it's relentless and protracted. Change in thinking, you know, we were pretty calm about volcano hazards um, before this eruption, but then we realized, wow, it can happen here, it can happen now. Uh, we need to amp up our hazards assessment and our monitoring the volcano hazards program, the USGS had its budget go up uh, tenfold. It's a venue for conflict and we're still having conflicts um, about how we deal with that landscape. There are people and agencies and other perspectives who wanna go out and actively try to restore the landscape. Um, the alternative perspective is let natural processes proceed substantially unimpeded, which is remarkably the language in the act of Congress that set up the National Volcanic Monument. And yet there's still big tensions, points of conflict. Do we plant trees or not? Do we spread grass seed for erosion control? And would grass seed actually, like on the debris avalanche, be effective given the erosion processes that are operating? Should we stock fish and permit fishing in lakes within the monument, the National Volcanic Monument? Or should we let the natural processes proceed so science can explore what's happening? And the list goes on. Turning to case two, the forest wars. Um, I worked, I've worked in the Andrews Experimental Forest east of Eugene, which was the place where the initial descriptions of old growth and the characterization of spotted owl, northern spotted owl occurred beginning in about 1970. And it was quite irrelevant work. Um, the work was funded by the National Science Foundation and the Dean of the College of Forestry at OSU told our leader, um, Jerry Franklin, a longtime prof at UAW, but back in the 70s, he was at in the Forest Service as a researcher in Corvallis and a courtesy appointment at OSU, the Dean said, hey, you're spending federal money to study the forests and you should be studying plantations because those are the forests of the future. But Jerry, who grew up in Camas, Washington, loved big old trees. So, and we had NSF money so we could study uh, big old trees and the whole incredibly complex ecosystem. And it started as irrelevant, turned out it was pre-relevant, and then it was hyper-relevant by, um, we started in 70 and by 1990, we we're getting into the injunctions on logging of native forests uh, on the um, federal lands and ranges of the Northern Spotted Owl, 24 million acres from San Francisco to the Canadian border. So. Anyway, the forest wars were um, an incredible social disturbance, but there was a lot of science that had gone on that set the stage for that. So here's an image by photographer David Paul Bales. And um, this is uh, published in terrain.org, an online journal in 2019. But he also has it on his webpage under the name Old Growth Dialogue. Dialogue, And so this is a forest with, uh, on the right and on the left, there are two 500 year old Douglas fir. They have tiny aluminum tags with numbers on them. So this is actually a research plot. But what you see is this incredible profusion of life, you know, uh, hundreds, of species of, of lichens and mosses and liverworts and it, it just incredibly complex.
But at that time, leading up to the, as the forest wars were developing, the national policy after World War II in the timber era of federal lands, national forest management was dispersed patch clear, clear cutting. So here's an example of it. So you see these, these patches, which were clear cut and then broadcast burned. You see one that's smoldering up there in the top. You see a couple blackened cutting units in the left center. And so this landscape is a patchwork of cutting units of different age, cutting into the native forest, which itself was of varying ages, uh, depending, you know, re reflecting the fire history. And then there is a network of roads to support this logging and fire suppression, fire detection. And um, the networks of roads are interacting with the networks of, of streams and riparian zones. So a battle was pitched, a judge, federal judge Dwyer leveled an injunction. And so the logging was stopped and there was uh, quite a tumult, which was recently reported in a very interesting series, a podcast series called Timber War by Oregon Public Broadcasting. To address this, this uh, situation, President Clinton in Al Gore, VP, came out and ran a day-long forest summit in Portland in April of 93. And um, they had a series of roundtable discussions. They had many members of their cabinet because not only were departments of interior where the forest service is located and, and um, oh, ag and interior, ag, forest service and ag, department of ag and, and Bureau of Land Management and other agents, relevant agencies in um, interior, but also treasury. And then this, the more human dimension secretaries uh, were present also. Um, in the Timber Wars podcast, there's an interesting story about a, a, um, some comments that, that Clinton made at lunch. And he was asked, well, what do you think about this, this, this program this morning? And Clinton said, well, you know, I'm not from this part of the country. I don't really know about uh, some of these timber issues, but it's a very familiar situation. And basically it comes down to change and people are not good with dealing with change. Hence my phrase, <laughs> the phrase I'm using, you know, these are big change events. And the toughest part in many ways is the human dimension. So this was on a Friday in April and the following Monday, a whole bunch of scientists were convened, maybe 35 or 40, many from the Andrews Forest because there are many people who worked on you know, old growth issues and northern spotted owl issues. Eric Forsman had started out doing that as a master's student in about 1972. And it, it was a, a topic that ran out his whole career. And, and watershed processes and effects of logging and roads on, on watersheds. These are all topics that have been studied intensively at the Andrews Experimental Forest beginning in 1948. So many Andrews folks went into the uh, 13th floor of the bank, US Bank Building in Portland to work for several months in crafting what became a foundation or a blueprint for the Northwest Forest Plan. And I happen to be part of that. And it struck me in the bullpen situation we had there that the terrestrial people, the owl people, or the old growth and forest disturbance people, they, they'd be in different cubby holes from the, the fish people, the salmon people, and the watershed people. And the types of maps, the old GIS maps, geographic information system maps that were on the walls in these different sectors differed. The river and the fish people had network maps, like the upper left. And the terrestrialists had patchwork maps, like 
cartooned here in the lower left. And I really realized, man, we, we don't have it together. The field of landscape ecology, this was 1993, we were, we were there, uh, had just taken shape in the mid 80s. And GIS, uh, this technology was just gaining use. And it was mainly being used for modeling and analyzing patchworks. And it wasn't much used for networks. And it certainly was not used for thinking about how networks like stream networks and road networks interacted with patchworks. So I realized, uh, you know, we really have on the science side, we, we, we haven't gotten our conceptual act together well enough to meet the policy planning and management needs. And I think other people have pursued that. I returned back to Corvallis and working with my, my partner, uh, Julia Jones in geography. We had a bunch of student projects and other projects to try to move this work forward. So forest wars, there was a history. You know, under the timber era, federal forest lands management, there was this progressive logging and roading in native forests, but it collided with the environmental legislation centered in the 70s, the National Environmental Policy Act, Endangered Species Act, National Forest Management Act, you know, Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act. Act. You know, Congress kept sort of telling the Forest Service it needed to be more environmentally and ecologically sensitive, but that ended up being a train wreck. Uh, so there were close in observations such as I just described of thinking about, about networks and patchworks. For me, that was an aha moment uh, in the thick of things. And then um, as we've learned since then, you know, we can foster old growth forest attributes in the landscape by protecting places that are old growth, for example, but spotted owls are still declining due to some combination of wildfire disturbance and Barred owls invading and displacing spotteds and lagged effects of habitat loss, maybe, you know, hypothetically. So we're still working our way through that. And there's a change in thinking in this, in this whole episode. The old order collapsed and the power shifted away from the utilitarian value of forests, uh, more, um, intrinsic ecosystem value and more attention to ecosystem management. So this is a, all about this tussle between how the forest should be used. Turning to the third case, uh, the flood of 96, and floods in general, but for me, the 96 flood was uh, central. And I had the, uh, again, the good fortune to be there in this case, right during the event, and uh, it was fascinating. And I was there with several other science people. And um, Gordon Grant was a Forest Service hydrologist. He was taking video, which was really important because we were seeing so many fascinating things in this place, in the Andrews Forest, where we had worked intensively for many years and tried to interpret what had happened. For example, in the 64 flood, I, didn't, I wasn't there in the 64 flood. But here we could see it live and, and our input channels of information for information were just flooded, literally, you know. And so we've gone back and looked at the video to, to try to make further interpretations of things that we couldn't absorb and process. So we've done a lot of study in the Andrews Forest. Uh, since logging began in about 1950, and I've worked on, on the um, history of logging and, and, and landslides from roads, from forested areas, from clear cut areas. So um, one of our principal study sites has to do with our experimental watersheds. And so here's the mouth of watershed three in the Andrews forest. Watershed three is coming in from the upper right. And the main, and enters the main stem of Lookout Creek, which is in the lower left, the, the latte down there in the far lower left. 
So here's a road across the middle. There are two figures there, just to the right of the two big standing trees on the left. So a whole series of debris flows came out of Watershed 3. Watershed 3 had gauging, stream gauging, gauging of the water discharge, the sediment discharge, beginning in 1952. Roads were built in 1959. 25% was cut in three patches, clear cut in 1963. And here comes the December 64 flood. And it triggers about 10 landslides. And they send debris flows, of batches of sediment that are bulldozering the wood lying in the channel, wood that in some cases had accumulated over the previous 100 plus years, bulldozering that wood forming these big debris flows, maybe a hundred cubic yards a piece down the channel. And then some of them would lodge on the road here, like here on the right. And so this was 64. Um, here's the same site, 1996 flood. And here's some of us out there scampering around in our yellow slickers. In both cases, these were rain on snow events. In both cases, we have a little bit of remnant snow. When we first got up there in the 96 flood, there was about a foot of snow at the bottom of the watershed at about 1300 feet elevation. Over the several days of the storm, the snow melted out. Um, it was a reservoir of water. And then a, a pineapple express from Hawaii came up with high winds high humidity and, and rain that deposited more water on the landscape and rapidly melted the snow, liberating that water to, to drive the floodwaters. So here we are, same exact place. And there was another set of 10 or so slides, mostly from roads, some from forested areas, uh, out of watershed three. But we don't have a big pile of logs. That's because the watershed has a memory of the 90 uh, of the 64 flood which had flood and had flushed the big wood out of the stream network wood that had accumulated over a very long period of time here in 96 we'd had only 32 years since the 64 flood and we had some spindly alder that had had grown up along that riparian zone but it got blasted out in the first debris flow and so there's much less big wood in this case. Uh, also, while we were out there during this event, it was, it was fascinating because we were very attuned to road hydrology and road geomorphology. Uh, uh, some work on these watersheds had um, of the stream flow history in relation to their logging and roading history had revealed that the magnitude of peak flows had gone up after those management actions. It was very interesting to be out there during the flood because the snow was actually influencing the passage of water relative to the roads. After the snow had melted out, that would have been very difficult to interpret, but we could see it unfolding over the course of the event, of, of the whole storm event over several days. We also had a bunch, about a hundred uh, erosion and deposition events related to the roads. And here's a schematic of some of the types of events uh, coming from the hill, slide, hill slope down to this cartooned road there. Um, and so some events come down and hit the road and stop, deposit, some start at the road and go down slope or go down stream. And so we've conducted studies of, of how the roads, the road network and the stream network interacted with the propagation of these disturbance processes and also the routing of, of sediment uh, through the landscape. And being out there and seeing it happen uh, was really critical. Actually, we were blocked in there for several days. I went down there in a hurry. I wasn't very well equipped. I had a big jug of goldfish crackers, and that was my main food stock for a while there. 
So to summarize, you know, there was his historical work and we were reflecting on the 64 flood and it helped inform us about what was gonna happen when the 96 flood did show up. And it actually um, really put a fire under several of us who once we sensed that it was coming because we could see what was happening on the web with the approaching storm, the condition of the snow and what was happening and the extreme gauging stations of the Andrews Forest Science Crew and the US Geological Survey, we put all that information together and say, we gotta get up there to see this happen and actually get in there before we'd be blocked and prevented from going in. So anyway, I talked about some of the close in observations about roads and rivers and routing of disturbances. And uh, we also had had a bunch of work on stream ecology in terms of these ecological responses, point three. Um, and it was really impressive how some, many species like the cutthroat trout uh, could really dodge the event, hang out in the, in the banks and their populations were not much affected by this raging torrent. And we could hear the big boulders going kofunk, kofunk, you know, coming down the stream. Uh, the sculpin and dace reside amongst the boulders. Their population is really plummeted, but those more mobile uh, taxa could sort of get out of the way. Um, change in thinking. Uh, this, these, this event really amped up our appreciation of the role of roads in um, routing of floodwaters and sediment and disturbances. And then uh, a, this was also a venue for conflict in terms of how do we modify our roads for watershed restoration while maintaining access for the many uses for which we might want to have access. Also 96, this is only two years into the Northwest Forest Plan period. And uh, so the National Forest and BLM were into, in a period of reassessing how they were going to manage not only the forest, but also the watersheds and the road systems in the context of floods. And floods are so important because they are the exams, they test our practices. And the big floods come only every few decades. And so they test how we have been doing in our practices. And uh, that's been important to look at how we've been doing and make adjustments. Finally, uh, for this set of four disturbance types, and I actually will add a fifth disturbance, which is arts and humanities, but um, <clears throat> a form of social prompting and disturbance, um, is the big fires in Western Oregon in 2020. And this is the eruption of the Holiday Farm Fire that blew down the McKenzie um, <clears throat> Valley 173,000 acres, it burned about 450 acres at low and moderate severity in the Andrews Forest. We were really in a delicate position. We could have lost our, our headquarters site, which has, uh, which has been built up over a long period of time. 70 beds, conference rooms, et cetera. But we, we didn't um, lose that. So again, this image from David Bales, and this is part of our arts and humanities program, long-term ecological reflections program, where we partner between the Spring Creek Project for Ideas, Nature, and the Written Word in the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion in OSU. It's privately endowed. That's, those are our humanities and arts partners with the Andrews Experimental Forest and Long-Term Ecological Research Program funded by the National Science Foundation since 1980. So this is an arts science thing about. And so look at this image of an old growth stand. And it is, this is before the fire. The site didn't burn, but imagine this is before the fire and this profusion of life. And then after the fire, we see a skeletal forest. Those epiphytes are stripped out the fire painted with a palette of black. In this site, it looks like uh, complete mortality, 
uh, the canopy was scorched and we do have the brown, which was golden early on, a litter of the foliage on the ground surface. As a disturbance and a history person, I'm stunned by this because I can see all these elements of history, uh, the old growth stand and the stumps and the call logs like here in the foreground that were left after logging maybe 60, 70 years ago. And then this stand that was burned by the fire, which just blew through at a high rate in their local pockets of smoldering. But for the most part, the fire just blitz through. And here's another image in that area. Most of the land burned was industrial forest land. So here you see, for the most part, young stands or this slope in the um, lower right um, had been cut several times, probably broadcast burned, and then uh, probably herbicided. So there's not much there. I'm struck, I'm struck by how much of the carbon is retained in the landscape, although the amount that is actually present is determined by how much was there the moment before the fire got there. I'm also struck, having gone up there uh, 15 or 20 times, in the uh, interest of time, I'll just skip over this. I have approached the uh, Holiday Farm Fire for the first time since I've retired almost a decade now, but I keep going out and doing the stuff that's interesting. Going to one of these disturbance zones with an artist, David Bales, whose work I've showed, I showed earlier. There's David on the right. And to not go as a scientist, but learn how to see the place through the eyes of a person who's a visual artist. Uh, so he has done a series of works. His central work at this point is represented by this one a part of about a 15 piece collection called Standing Still, Standing Comma Still. And it's with reverence for these individual cedars rooted on the banks of the Mackenzie River right there. And he has great respect for these trees that have been battered by many disturbances. And uh, this is on his own webpage. Um, and so this is the fine art piece of his work. He was a portrait, he has been a portrait photographer, portraits of people and buildings for a long time. And so portraiture shows through here. And so the fires paint with black, the volcanoes paint with gray. And so now we're very interested in how color comes back into this landscape by physical processes and by biological processes. And so here he is uh, setting up to photograph this um, tree that, that broke after the fire. So this exposed wood is bringing this, this golden color back into the landscape. So David is the artist and he focuses literally and figuratively on form and on color, and I'm sort of the science type, and I'm interested in biological and physical processes and how they accumulate over time in, 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 in the form of history. And we're both interested in forest composition, and we both go into these places that are incredibly complex at first glance, and we go into this place on common ground because neither of us had been in there before, and we're interested in the forest composition. And now we have a set of photo points that we are tracking over time, including vertical panoramas that go from the crown straight into the forest and to the ground. So we can track how the breakup of the crown is delivering material to the forest floor and how that, that fallen dead biomass is interacting with the live biomass that's attempting to emerge from the forest floor.
And so we have a shared practice in our own, in our different ways. And, you know, we were out there working away and we just stop and say, okay, how are you seeing this? And then we talk back and forth. You know, he has typologies where he will pick out a particular aspect of the blackened forest and take 50 shots of examples of it, like bent twigs or limbs or, or crowns of different structures. And so he will decompose what he's seeing and then gradually accumulate or recompose a fuller image. And I do that from a his, history perspective. And I think tracking this through time will be, bring us together, but we're only eight months into it. We haven't gone through a full year yet. So I just closed with two images, um, two slides with multiple image in this case. Um, with a little upper about how much life there is. And in the upper two images are biological legacies at Mount St. Helens with an amphibian that was hanging out in the mud of a lake, probably under ice and snow cover in Alpine Lake, and a trillium in the summer of 1980 that had been hiding in the soil beneath a snowbank. The blast laid deposits on top as the snow melted out. It busted up the stratigraphy, the layering, so that the trillium could emerge. And here's some recent arrivals across the bottom um, on the, on the um, giant landslide deposit. And finally, a view from last Friday from the Holiday Farm fire. Lots of life coming in, you know, oxalis. And then this is the base of a big broadleaf maple that's starting to sprout and ferns are everywhere and a month or two ago, the mosses were just all over the place. So I'm afraid I've gone on too far, but uh, I'll quit there and happy to entertain any um, comments or questions. Uh, hi, Fred. This is Deb Naisland, and um, I'm just looking in the chat. One of the questions we had was, uh, please explain why old growth large trees are burned to stumps and younger trees are look singed. Oh, yes. Thanks for that question. <laughs> the, the, there was an old growth stand there that was logged, and some call logs, some logs of not merchantable value were left there. And then the younger trees are the stand that came in after that logging. So they're two different generations of forests on the same site. So we're actually looking back at, you know, trees that were like the stumps were trees that had established, you know, probably 500 years ago. And then they were cut 80, 90 years ago, the area was probably clear cut. And then there, there may have been planting, but there's a good bet that it was not planting at that time. So those trees that were, you know, volunteered, some of them were, were hardwoods like broadleaf maple that might have been damaged in the logging, but not killed and then just re-sprouted because some of them were in clumps with multiple large diameter stems. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I have a question that you had answered before when I heard you and I thought it was such a great question or great answer. So could you describe the uh, response of uh, non-native invasives when there's a big change event? That's a, that's a really important and interesting question. As I mentioned, um, so this fire blew down the valley and it mostly affected um, private industrial forest land, 
private non-industrial forest land and a bunch of residential areas right along the river. And so there were many invasive species. Of course, um, Scotch broom and, um, and blackberry were very prevalent. There was a holly farm for her Christmas decorations. And you could see how over the decades, you know, the holly had spread and, and there, I was really upset by the amount of English ivy, but that, those, those were pretty much in the residential area. So anyway, some of those species are of significant concern out in the forest land. And so um, it will be very interesting to see what happens um, <clears throat> following the fire. At first blush, you say, oh, wow, there was a big blackberry thicket there, and it's so great to see it get torched. But it, it looks like the ones I've seen look like they're going to come on uh, like gangbusters. And um, at the Andrews Forest, um, my sweetie, Julia uh, Jones, the um, geography prof, she's had students working on exotic plants along road networks in the forest landscape. And so forest road networks occupy only a few percent of the total landscape area, but they are uh, places with lots of non-native species because you have bare soil areas, higher light levels, and so, and you also have a lot of traffic, human and vehiculars, you know, so these non-natives can get out into the landscape uh, very widely distributed. And then if you disturb the patches, this is a, one of these network patchwork phenomena. You know, you may distribute the propagules in the point, you know, out the network. And then if you disturb those patches, it may facilitate the movement of those non-natives out across the larger landscape. So this is something we really have to be attentive to. Um, I'm, I'm curious as to how this is going to go. Thanks. Um, how old is an old growth forest? And are the ones there now worth saving? Um, well, when I started working on this stuff, I was working with Jerry Franklin, called by some the guru of old growth. <laughs> um, Anyway, we thought of old growth as being 200 years old plus, and mature was 80 to 200. And then when the war, forest wars, the old growth wars, but forest wars in general cranked up, there were pushes by some parties to bring the minimum age of old growth down so that more could be um, protected if protection uh, was the policy. So uh, what is old growth? Um, you get out to about age 120. It, it, well, it depends on what forest type and the site productivity and things like that. But once you get out past 100, 120, then the structure of the dominant trees is beginning to change. You're starting to have fan-shaped branch systems, which can be uh, purchased for different kinds of birds and small mammals and things like that. And, and just the complexity of the forest really picks up. I look at a 500-year-old forest and I think it is 500 years. It, it isn't just that it's a big old tree. It's got so much epiphyte cover and all these bugs and all these hidey holes. I mean, it's just, it's just so amazingly complex and these micro disturbances have gone on over time. And um, they're, they're, just, they're just amazing. What was the second half of your question? Um, is it worth saving them? Well, that's a, that's a value <laughs> decision. Um, I've I've asked myself that question. For example, in Mount St. Helens, in the blast zone, 
there were areas where some 600 year old forest was knocked down by the blast. Um, is that still an old growth forest? Uh, to me it is. Um, and the, at the Andrews Forest, we have a, a 200 year log decomposition experiment. This is year 36. Um, and the logs, the, these are logs that are only about, you know, 20 inches in diameter, you know, and only uh, about 18 feet long. So they aren't old growth logs. Um, our, our chief rotter, Mark Harmon, who set up this experiment in 1985 when he was a grad student, he just retired. Um, you know, he's, he says, well, they're, they're more living cells per cubic centimeter in what we call a dead log than in the heartwood of a live tree. Because there are all these decomposers in there. And then there's so many species that are associated with these dead logs. So the life of a dead tree in some ways is richer and more protracted than the life of what we call a live tree. So you know, we gotta you know, reimagine our relation with the natural world. <laughs> Thanks. Um... So I'm gonna combine two questions. Um, one is about um, uh, how to persuade uh, homeowners on restoring 10% uh, of their, 10% of the habitat on their property. Um, and then the other question was about um, uh, landowners role in, um, maintenance and stewardship of their land. So how to communicate those types of ideas or? Well, I see some of my colleagues who are also uh, retired, but still active, you know, writing op-ed pieces and things like that. And I'm, I'm not gonna do that. It's just a personal, choice. Um, but I, that's why I've been working really hard for 20 years to um, try to get, facilitate artists and writers access to the Andrews Forest and to Mount St. Helens. We've had more than 100 writers and artists in residence at the Andrews Forest, and they've produced an amazing and rich body of works. They are in the forest log on the um, Spring Creek web page, Oregon State University, College of Liberal Arts. And so the forest log uh, lists all the people who've been in residence as a paragraph bio sketch and then a link to their works. And some of them, you know, are just, you know, great. You know, a poem to like it for the lichens in the Atlantic, and um, actually um, the book Overstory by Richard Powers, uh, which was the novel, the fiction book of the year, a Pulitzer Prize for 2019, actually has some of the Andrews as part of the story. It's not explicitly called the Andrews. So anyway, this work this work is getting out. And so my feeling is the more the artists and writers and scientists who can tell stories can, you know, stimulate a sense of wonder and awe and a sense of the mystery of the place, like David Bales's images capture, convey visually a sense of the mystery and, and a theologian who was a writer in residence, Vince Miller, wrote an amazing essay. And he used, he, he brought in Vince Miller's images because they are spiritual. You know? So um, anyway, the point is, the more these people can help people, help the public 
the landowners sense wonder, awe, mystery, the more likely they are to be good stewards. Are we gonna wreck things that we think are wonderful, awesome and mysterious? Probably not. So anyway, that's the approach that I'm investing my own energy in these right, days. Um, do trees, do some trees survive? Um, do some trees survive the trees more than others? Industrial planning versus original mixed forest trees. Uh, yes, it's very interesting to go out and you know, look at patches of forest and you know, both, both the homes or the, the buildings and the forest landscape um, is such a complex, you know, a pattern of a burn, you know, there'll be a house that was totally leveled and uh, right next to a house that survived for reasons that aren't at all obvious. And, and but same with the trees. And so my impression, and there's been some research on it, and I expect there'll be a lot more uh, working on these fires, is that if you have, you know, a monoculture, a simple stand that has continuous crown, um, the fire is likely to burn rather completely through it. Whereas if you have a, an old growth stand, you have some big trees, you got some middle sized trees, you got some little trees, you have different species with different bark thicknesses, different vulnerabilities to uh, fire damage. Uh, the fuel is sort of dispersed over 250 vertical feet. Um, then it seems to me, my impression is that the fire is much more heterogeneous and that you have greater potential for survival. But we want, I, I like to see the numbers. I'm not gonna go generate the numbers myself, but um, there's, there've been some publications uh, about that. Right. And an interesting thing is, um, you know, just like I mentioned with the floods, the 64 flood on Forest Service lands in the region came, you know, um, after about 15, 20 years into the first flush of forestry development with the dispersed patch clear cutting scheme on the national forest lands. And that showed us that our roads were not good enough to deal with bigger flood events. So some changes were made. And so we made those changes. And then we go another 30 years and we have another big flood. Um, and so these test events come along episodically and we do things in the interim that we hope are okay. And so uh, the same thing with the big fires. So we've had management schemes on both federal and private lands for many decades. And then we get this big test event with these fires. And now we have to go take a critical rigorous look at how the different stands performed and assess them in the context of their histories. If we have a second or third rotation forest that's on a 35 year rotation, and we were herbiciding it and broadcast burn, burning it, at least in earlier days, we may have eliminated a lot of the native understory plants. And they might be critical for holding the soil in place on steep slopes and having vigorous rootstocks and it's an ability to to come back and maintain um, woody or vigorous uh, non-woody root systems and help hold the soil on place. That one image I showed looking down a road with a green tree in the middle and that um, barren slope on the right where I said there'd been a couple rotations in there. Uh, we were out there on a Saturday morning after a cold night the sun was coming on the slope, the needle ice was melting, and we just listened 
to the stones rattle down the hill slope. There was no vegetation on it. So my point is, um, I picture the older native forest as having more intact understory vegetation and more intact dead wood on the ground uh, that is gonna help hold the soil in place than places that have gone through a couple of rotations of pretty intensive management. But you've gotta go out and give it a look. Thank you. Okay, I have one more question, I think. There's more pop-up. Um, and this is from Judy Finn. And she, uh, or she, she describes, she proposes something and then asks if it's true. I believe there is a general perception that great advances in technology enable us as a society more capable than ever to deal with big change events. Is this true? And if not, what is the true state of readiness and preparedness? And then she has another question, which is what are the immediate, uh, it, it, what are the impediments preventing us from acting responsibly in this regard? As I suggested in my reference to aha moments, I'm an old school guy. I think it's important to go out on the land and look at it and talk with other people who have different points of view on, on the land as soon as you can. Because it's easy to jump to conclusions or to believe your assumptions. And that's one concern I have with all the new technological capacity of remote sensing and modeling and, and fancy pants data analysis techniques is if we don't have good ideas about what are actually, what is actually happening out there on the land, we can conjure up all kinds of fairy tales. So I'm, I'm old school. I, I do think that <clears throat> the technology technology will be important but it isn't going to replace careful field observation uh, the second question was very challenging <laughs> i i um i i just go back to to feeling like um I'm not going to try to impose my value judgments on, on other people, but I, I, I do think that um, the more reverence, more respect we have for the natural world, the better we will um, behave as, as land stewards. I think we really have to hold ourselves to that. Well, thank you so much. Um, you got many comments about what a great talk this was. Um, I know I um, I heard many different things the second time, even. <laughs> so I'm really um, I really appreciate um, you presenting for us tonight, and um, and also uh, uh, you know on the short notice too. That was just wonderful. And and there are such ri rich little nuggets in here. But I know we're going to be go back, going back to that recording and listening again. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to go have dinner. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful. Appreciate it.